Well, hmm, very interesting uncertainty. And the last bit of comment that I was going to add to comment on fifteen fifty four is it meaning was that um, I was going to give an example, but it didn't actually get recorded. I lost it. I don't know how long. Ten minutes, perhaps. A recording. So now I'm having to do it again. I'm doing it separately. It's a sort of safety precaution. I don't want to see what happens to this. Okay, what I was going to say was, I'd experienced, i will give you an example of what I was trying to um, illustrate. The cat was pestering at the door. It's gone seven o'clock in the morning, wants to be fed. I don't want him to be fed this early, so I'm ignoring it. But because of his importunity, Ah, I can't rest and do what I want to do, so I record. Oh, sorry. So I go and feed him. And on the way down the stairs, it occurs to me, well, don't give him quite what he wants, but at least, you know, give him enough to shut him up. And uh, that way I'm still training him that he doesn't get fed properly until a certain time. There's no point in... And it'll take the edge off his hunger and, and stop him pestering me. Right. Now, <clears throat> in some sense, that's what God does with us. Uh, he would rather do what he thinks is best, but because of your importunity, he gives way. He gives way, I think, in fact, because he doesn't want you to simply wander off and not love him and, um, and be at risk. You know, if my cat goes wandering off and looks for food elsewhere, and may get lost, and life could become very unhappy for him. And I don't want that to happen. So because of his importunity, I feed him. I do what he asks, more or less. Okay. So Marshall gets what he wants. He wants mum to be devoted to him, and she is until a certain time comes, when she isn't. And uh, she leaves, arguably because of him, and because of difficulties, and this, that, and the other. And Marshall realizes that Mum can't manage her new situation, so he, he can't manage it for her either. So he puts her on a train to her mum, where she can stay in the house with her and look after mum, be a blessing to her mum, and uh, have somewhere to be provided for. Not at the same affluent level as she had here, but, um, you know, in her original home with dad. But at least something better than what she seems to be confronted with at the minute. So Marshall does pragmatically what is best, which looks, he feels a bit guilty about it, you know, should I be caring for mum more in some way, but I can't, I don't have the wherewithal. He does what he thinks is best. And it's costing him the relationship with mum. He's launching out as an adult. He's doing what is right. Not happy that that's the circumstance, but that's what's best in the circumstance. Whether Mum feels deserted by him or not, well, yes, possibly. Yeah, I mean, um, but it was the best thing, and in hindsight, it was the best thing too. So Marshall goes off in life seeking similar relationships where devotion, as he's experienced with mum, is eternal. Mm, of course it's not so. The wives leave him, they're children too, just like mum is a child. They're all children. They can't have the integrity that God has. And Perhaps it dawns on Marshall he can't have the integrity that God has either. 
but he is pursuing such and will continue to pursue such. It's just that he is pursuing such with the wrong object. Now, Jesus does not commend marriage. Paul doesn't commend marriage. He only says, well, if that's your only choice, you better go for it. But I don't recommend it. I don't commend it to you. And Jesus is emphatic, you know, but they that are born of God, neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are of the angels of God in heaven. And we tend to think, oh, that means um, they're uh, not in sexual relationship. Mm, somehow we've still got in mind they're still men and women, but mm, not needing sex. No, it's not that. Uh, it's that the angels of God in heaven are devoted to God, not each other. You're meant to be neighbour to each other. And give to him that asks as good advice. Neighbour rescues where you are desperate. Well, they can. They don't rescue you by being devoted to you. The Samaritan was not devoted to the person he rescued, but he was neighbour. And the one that was rescued should treat the Samaritan as himself, not as God, and be devoted to him. He shouldn't be devoted to himself. That's futile. You need to be devoted to God. Do you see? We have misunderstood. We have been led astray by this theme in our universe of uncertainty that to love another is to be devoted to them. No, it's not. Love one another if you love yourself. How should you love yourself? Do the best for yourself, which is to worship God and trust in Him, not yourself. And therefore, if you love another as yourself, you are encouraging them to do the same. You're not seeing them as the source of all your joy and happiness in marital bliss or in parental relationships. Do you see the difference? I have fundamentally misunderstood what love is. Love in the form of devotion is only appropriate to God, not a wife or a husband, a child or a parent, or an earthly parent. Not pets, not career, not not mission, not anything, but God. That's the first principle. And if you don't keep that, you're still here in the universe of uncertainty, because you haven't met the requirement for harmony in heaven, which is not to see others as the source of all your joy and happiness. God is. Certainly there is a pleasure and a happiness in helping others and being a blessing to them. That's true. But your devotion is to God. If we are all devoted to God, we will be good to each other without being some burden on each other without consuming each other, without insisting that the other person be as I am in order to live in harmony with me. Do you see that to be worshipping each other is a disaster? We are of the same family but uniquely different. 
we are of our Heavenly Father. It's true, many of the genes in you are the same as in me. And that you and I, if we are on the path, share another commonality, which is that God dwells in you. In the sense that you're aware of such, as I am. You may even be aware of God in a very similar way to the way I'm aware of God. But you will have your unique view of God, which is not quite the same as mine. We are managing to live in harmony because we're not trying to worship each other and therefore control what each other thinks and does, such that it's in harmony with us. Do you see, in a sense, I'm not seeking a harmony with each other. I'm seeking a loyalty to God. And the harmony comes as a consequence. If you too are seeking to worship God, we find that there is far, far less friction between us, even with our different views of God. And I can be with someone who's of a totally different religion or, or branch of the religion to what I'm in. They're absolute fundies, so literalists and so on. But I can find this commonality in that he's devoted and so am I. And not just to other people, but to God in specifically. True, his view of God is different to mine, but already, gosh, We've got a lot in common, and there's a lot I admire and value in him. Do you see? You want to know what love is to other people. Ultimately, it has to be that. The love is the fact that he is devoted to God, and I'm devoted to God. In this world, he's devoted to his God, and I'm devoted to my God. But there's still a mismatch going on. In heaven, those two have become identical. It's the one God, the one that is. And their devotion to the one God brings us into a wonderful harmony with each other while still being able to experience and benefit from the uniqueness of each one of us because they've come via a different view of God to each other including you but you're in harmony because now that God is the same God. The harmony comes from the commonality and the commonality is loving the same God. But what we do here in the universe of uncertainty is I try to force you, press you, to love the God that I know, my God, and you try to press me that I should love the God that you love. And we're both wrong because we're both still in this universe. Which means we have a slightly wrong view of God. At least slightly wrong. <laughs> wrong, that's the main thing. And I know that because I'm still here, my view is still wrong too, which should give me some moderation anyway in trying to persuade you. But I shouldn't persuade you to love my God. You should love your God. With all your heart, soul, mind and strength. Not mine. You can't love mine. You have to love yours. And I should not be prevailing upon you to love mine. I speak to those that have ears to hear, that is all. I'm not there persuading Satan or um, Pilate to turn over a new leaf and come back to God. 
they're worshipping their God. And yes, they're having a rough time, but they're not even asking for my help. If they did, I would say what I thought was best. But I wouldn't in any sense press it or impose it on them. I only give to him that asks. You see, I've learned to live in harmony with the incredible variety that's in this world. I'm increasingly finding ways to live in harmony with what is extremely inharmonious, inconsistent with my view. And it's that training that prepares us for heaven. That we can keep in heaven our uniqueness and they can keep theirs. And still we live in harmony. Why? Because, well, there we love the same God. Our God is the same God. And that commonality is the binding of family. You're my brother and sister because your dad is the same as mine. Nothing new here. Anyone could have told you that. Why didn't you hear? <laughs> oh, thank you, Heavenly Palm. I don't know what to do about me, but I know you do. Did you get that or did I cover the speaker? You don't know what to do about me, Heavenly Father, but you do. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In passing then, let me say, did you notice that all things work together for good? So the recording of addition to the comment, uh, you know, it wasn't successful. And I was, um, have a mind and have, I had another shot at it and it's come up with different, different outcomes, different development and still a blessing and presumably a greater blessing than if God had left it the way it was, or the way I thought it was going to be. Wow. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Okay, see if I can rescue this recording. Coming back to where I started, I was going to give the example of the cat. And because of his importunity, I give him less than what he wants, but enough to keep him quiet. He still needs to be trained not to pester me earlier and earlier in the morning. I'm, I'm holding a, a time, you know, really in a sense, arguably, uh, I'm not going to feed him before eight o'clock. I don't want it to get back too early, I'm 5.30 and 5 o'clock and he's waking me in the night if he wants, you know. So I do give way to his importunity, I don't give him the full training now. He doesn't take the message, he's going to insist. Now that's Marshall through his life, isn't it? Mum goes and three wives go and possibly the fourth unofficial one to begin with, but, you know, an affair that's not, uh, well, it's a secular relationship, put it that way. And Marshall insists on replacing, because that's what he sees as fulfilling, this is what he values, having someone that loves him permanently, so he must go out and find her. Um, he doesn't give up. But nor does God. Because that is not the way you become qualified for heaven. To become qualified for heaven, you need to be devoted to God, not to 
anyone else. If we're all devoted to God, then we have this commonality that allows for difference, which is what a family is about. We have the same father, the same bond is there, but we're all different, but we are in harmony, ideally, right? Now Marshall has to learn this, and he learns it the hard way. Uh, even though he's Christian from the first wife onwards, he still learns it the hard way. That It's very simple. It says there, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength. It doesn't say, love your wife and be totally devoted to her. And Jesus doesn't say that either. And Paul doesn't seem to commend that either. Sure, if you are married, well, you're going to love your wives. And wives, you're not going to love your husband, you'd be obedient to him. <laughs> I like that. <laughs> oh, that would have made my, my mum tear her hair out. And I can tell you, a situation where, you know, I think Dad did love Mum, but Mum didn't love Dad. And Dad did rule over her, and Mum didn't like it, and was obedient. And yes, they'd have been better continuing in this state. But in a sense, and this I speak against myself, Perhaps it would have been better not to come together in the first place. Really. And of course it would definitely have been better if they had both chosen to love God, but that just was not on the cards for either of them, was it? No. So they experienced the hardships that they experienced. And did it result in them finishing life loving God well? Not as far as I know, no. Not much, in, no, no indication of that, quite honestly. I say quite honestly, I mean, which is to say that um, I'd like there to be some indication, but I don't see any indication of such. Getting back to the essence of what's important here in the discussion as I see it, is that you can always hold God up. You can always delay coming to God. But it's not in your interest to do so. If I'd chosen to love God when I first read Paramhansa, and I remember this Indian lady saying to me, um, no, I mean, I had sort of vague interest that she might become a girlfriend. Um, but she wasn't on that track at all. And, and her advice to me was, um, you know, don't, don't seek after a partner. Seek after loving God. Um, that's more important. Now, I mean, she was not Christian. She was presumably Hindu. And uh, I could hear her, but I didn't think I was up to it. And in a sense, that was valid. I wasn't up to it. I was so seeking someone to love earnestly, person, that... Um, Because physically I was so um, not content on my own. My fun and pleasure is relating to another person, a wife. And I've spent the rest of my life doing that in large measure, in great measure, far more than most people, far, far more than most people. 
I don't see marriages like the three marriages I had. I see people that fall in love. That's common to me as well, I mean. But not the continuing devotion and doing everything together that I felt was absolutely majorly important, so important. In other words, they don't seem to continue to worship each other. They're absolutely head over heels for each other for a while, which is just what I've experienced too. But they don't continue in that vein. They level out. As Marshall didn't, wouldn't, in all three marriages. Until the wife forced it. By disregarding me and then going. In fact, disregarding God first, then me and then going. I really feel that all three could not maintain going while still being Christian. So Christianity went to an extremely low ebb in order to allow leaving Marshall. Hmm. None of the three, as far as I can see, return to the ardour of loving God afterwards. They might have returned to religion in some ways. The first marriage she did formally, she now went to the Church of England, which from our point of view before would have been like not really being Christian much at all. And uh, the second one doesn't go anywhere near religion, but is into not really spiritual things, into conspiracy theory. I'm not sure it's that spiritual. No. And the third one, she's almost looking for answers in the Western understanding of Eastern religions. Almost there, not completely devoid of the spiritual, therefore, by any means, I suppose. I've yet to see how it's going to develop. Hmm. So God unquestionably gave away to my importunity, my demand, need and search for that which would not bring what I hoped it would bring. And he supplied wonderfully accordingly. And still demonstrated in all three cases. Four. That it doesn't work. You've got to change your values. You've got to realize the values you have are not feasible, not compatible with heaven, not compatible with what you truly need and what you truly value. You've got to bring your values round to that. I mean, in simplistic terms, you are not looking for a, an eternal partner other than God. And until you do that, you cannot succeed, you cannot be happy. Because, of course, quite rationally, you're banking on the imperfect. By definition, something that must let you down eventually. That must cause you the unhappiness that you don't want. Which is not what heaven's about. Heaven is about joy and peace and all goodness. It's complete, it's perfect. That is what you need. And if that's what you need, that is what you should be valuing. And until you value what you truly need, you're courting disaster. 
all the time. So your meaning to life, your purpose in life, is to find out what is not courting disaster. What are my true needs and the values appropriate to those true needs? This may take a long time, but it could be quite quick. Depends if you know what the purpose of life is. Once you do know what the purpose of life is, that's going to speed up the process because you're going to be alert to and alive to, oh, these problems are because I've got something wrong in the understanding of what my values should be to be what I truly need. Harmony, happiness, well-being, eternal life. I truly need eternal life. Whereas I'm valuing something that's not of eternal life. It's not reliable. It's not safe to love your partner, to choose a partner instead of loving God. is not safe to be devoted to your partner instead of devoted to God. You can love many people, but not be devoted to them which you have followed a devotion to your partner, a devotion which uh, is to something that's going to cost you damage, especially if you continue to be devoted to it when it causes you damage. In other words, you shouldn't have entered into a married relationship from that eternal blessed point of view. But you should be as the angels of God are in heaven, neither marrying nor giving in marriage, but worshipping God. Adult children of God worship God and love each other, yes. They love each other as they love themselves, which is to say, how can I encourage you to be more devoted to God? Not how can I encourage you to be more devoted to me and me to you? Do you see that's different? Thank you, Heavenly Father. Well, I realized at last that <clears throat> I hadn't not recorded um, the comment to the recording that it was meant to be to. I had recorded it and I'd put it on the end of the um, piece. Meaning, put it on the end of it. And as you can see, when I did it again, it developed differently. I tried to get the same content as far as I could remember, but of course I went off on the way that it went. And, uh, well, that was interesting. God did make it a blessing. I got it both ways. Wow. Thank you, Heavenly Father. You see what it is, when you're looking for God in your life, life becomes a joy, absolute joy. When you become sensitive to the kindness of God, lots of things all day long. Life is wonderful, even here in the world of uncertainty. In fact, even the uncertainty becomes, of course, a blessing in God's hands. What is, is a blessing to those that love him, called according to his purpose, sensitive to his presence, know his purpose, know him as Father. Quite simply, Jesus got it right. Wow. <laughs> Thank you, Heavenly Father.